Ricardo Varela, Latino Rebels Radio. You know what? I am just ready to bring in. I don't know if you guys know, but when I had we had Christian Enriquez, who was kind of our first uh, host, but then we had another host, and she is like twenty times better than Christian Enriquez, and she's out in Ohio, and she's back. Um, Monica Ramirez, what's up? Hi, we love Christian. We love him. <laughs> You've always been the nicest person. So you're you're in Ohio. Um, you know, my theme song didn't work. I this is what I love about doing this pilot. You know, it's kind of the early days of Latino Rebels Radio. Sometimes when we would remember this, we'd be like, oh, let's just go on. Um, but anyway, yeah. You uh, you're out in Ohio. You do amazing work for uh, farm worker rights, women's rights, immigrants' rights racial justice, economic justice, like, yeah, you know, you're wicked smart, as they say. Um, I you. wanted to talk to you about, uh, first of all, how are you doing? How are you doing? I mean, it's good to see you. I feel like it's like we got the old gang again. My mom's already on. So I'm just letting you know that my mom oh. is already on the show. <laughs> hey, hey, Barbara, mom, please send me the e please, please send me the Easter pie. Mom, please. I know you can't, yes. but you know, I, she's anyway. <laughs> so my mom's on. Um, <laughs> in my um, it's, yeah, so it's tell me what you're doing. How are you doing? On the air together. Yeah. You know, I think as well as we can be under the circumstances, I think we're all trying to figure out how to manage this moment that none of us could have been prepared for. But um, doing okay. You? I'm good. I'm, you know, like I said, you know, it's good to see you. It's good to see other friends of Latino Rebels, the OGs. And I wanted to bring you on because obviously – Ever since, you know, I've known you for several years, uh, I've seen you just become this incredible advocate for, um, oh, my mom just told me that my Easter pie, sorry, is in the freezer. So uh, at least she's made it for me. So the next the next time you. I get down to New York, I'm going to have Easter pie. So anyway, sorry. Um, that, the important <laughs> news, Monica, like I have to do that. Uh, breaking, breaking news, Easter pie is in the freezer. <laughs> so... Um, Tell me, you know, one of the things that you've been working on with farm workers and farm worker rights, and especially in this pandemic, because a lot of people are like, our food supply, our food supply, we have to have our food supply. And and people don't realize that, you know, our food supply is actually like picked or, or you know, worked on by a lot of people who are, are essentially, you know, visa holders that come in and work in a, in a lot of these companies. Before we get into like the COVID thing, can you just provide like, a really like basic overview of, you know, the farm worker program in the United States and uh, why it's, you know, can you share more with people? Sure. So, um, you know, there are two, it's an estimated that there are two to three million farm workers in our country and farm workers are the people who plant our food, who pick our food, who pack our food. And, um, you know, for farm workers, I come from a farm worker family. You know, I my family once migrated um, the migrant stream from Texas and all around the Midwest. And so for those of us who are from the farm worker community, I mean, we know well the unique aspects of the community. But I think for most other people, uh, farm workers are pretty invisible because they tend to live out in the outskirts of towns. They live in small communities. And so most people just don't know the basics about farm workers. Um, and so I think it's important for people to realize that the overwhelming majority of farm workers in our country are Latinx, Latino, yeah. Latina, um, most of most of whom are Mexican, Mexican-American. And um, there are farm workers who are seasonal, which means they live in one place year round. And as the seasons change and the crops change, they do the agricultural work. Um, and then there's a, a large number of farm workers in our country who are migratory, which means that they travel the stream and they travel right. from state to state and they pick the different crops. And then you're talking about guest workers. So right. guest workers actually are a pretty small percentage of the overall farm worker population in our nation. Um, although that, you know, more growers are starting to um, seek those visas for H-2A workers, H-2A guest workers to come into the country for a limited period of time on a special visa to work in, in agriculture. Um, and, you know, I always feel like what people need to know about farm workers is that our community has been left out for all, you know, since the beginning of establishing 
employment and labor laws in our country for workers. You know, in 1938, when the basic employment law in our country was established for workers, which created the minimum wage and right. all those other minimum worker rights, farm workers were left out of that. You know, farm workers earn, you know, an estimated, you know, $20,000 a year, twenty to $20,000 to $24,000 a year. Women earn less um, than men. And for those who are migratory workers, um, you know, workers tend to travel together in vans and buses and they live in labor camps. And so if you can imagine a labor camp, you're talking about a little shack often, you know, out in the middle of the country. Right. Often they don't have their own, you know, drink, you know, their own bathing facilities. They don't have their own cooking facilities. And so it's very tight quarters, shared um, bathing and, and cooking facilities. And then, you know, people um, basically all the conditions that people are telling us to avoid, like being, you know, keeping, staying far apart from one another, washing our hands often. That's not, those aren't things that farm workers actually can do very easily because of right. the conditions that they live and work there. So with that said, obviously you're hearing all this, you know, we got to keep the food supply going and there's this like, you know, we're all in this together and, you know, you, can you share sort of looking at the farm worker issue like on all the levels because you're right they're they're different types and um but how this is all sort of converging during this COVID-19 crisis that people might not really understand what you know what I mean like that was why I wanted to bring you on because I think you know I think the last couple of days I mean and you were on MSNBC and people were starting asking the question and you see like the New York Times talking about it and now farm workers are essential and but it's not as simple as like oh the farm workers are going to give us the food and everything's going to be fine i mean can you share more about that because i think that's what's being missed in this well yeah i mean and there's a lot there you know um you, so here's i'm giving you as much time as you want this is like we're with friends there's there's no rush you're not you it's not a 3 minute take here with Alicia Menendez you can just you got plenty of time. <laughs> plenty of time. I wish all the interviews were like this. Um, so people are asking, uh, do are we food secure? And, um, you know, if you've been reading in the newspaper, people have been saying like, oh, you know, we ha their, their farmers are having to, um, their, who aren't having their crops picked. There's, um, you know, dairy farmers who are having to dump you know, gallons of, I don't even know how much um, quantity of milk. And so that's happening because our food supply is sort of off kilter right now because you had this situation in which many people went at one time to purchase goods because they were told to do that. And so they emptied these grocery shelves. And and so our food supply is, is not running as it normally would. Right. Um, and, but what we've said is, as advocates who work with the farm worker community, that, you know, the quantity of food is one thing, but the reality is if you don't have the workers who are well enough and protected enough, who are quote unquote essential enough to have out there working, but without the protections, then that's actually the real danger to our food supply. Because if farm workers start getting sick as they already are, um, and if you have a situation in which it, the, you know, someone in a labor camp were to get COVID, you're talking about the possibility of dozens and even hundreds of workers getting the illness and then who's going to do the work, you know, right. um, because the reason that our farmers in our country rely on guest workers is because they can't, they say they can't find local labor. They can't find workers to do the work. And so that's why they're bringing people in on visas to do the work. Um, but if you have migratory and seasonal workers who get sick or even guest workers who get sick and there are no local workers who are available to do the work, then that's the danger to our food supply because then we're going to have a situation in which crops are going to be rotting in the fields because there's no one to pick them. Um, wow. So that's okay. that piece. Yeah. But the other thing is when we talk about food supply and food security, you know, I was on a call last night with over 100 um, farm worker leaders from different parts of the country and story after story was emerging about how people just, they didn't have food to feed their own family so you're talking about workers who are going to work at five o'clock in the morning six o'clock in the morning they're working 10 and 12 hour days wow. and then they picking the food that we are eating and then they don't have food for their families and i feel like that is horrific and enraging 
And the reason that that's happening is because the workers say that by the time they go to work, the stores aren't open and they work all day long. Right. And by the time they get out of work, there's nothing closed. left. Yeah, there's nothing left Everything. or things are closed. Like, you know, yeah. Wow. Exactly. And then others are talking about how immediately their income was cut in half because if you had a two um, household family, a working family, um, one of the uh, parents had to stay home because they no longer had childcare and schools were not in session. And so and all of a sudden when you had you know, two parents who were working, you had one parent working and their income was cut in half. You know, you have a situation in which, you know, schools or daycares provided food for the children during the day, breakfast and lunch, right. and families bought what they needed for, you know, the weekends and for dinner. But now you have situations in which you have families who are trying to make sure that they have enough food in the house for the meals that their kids would have gotten when they were at school. So there is a food crisis in this country right now. And the people who are suffering the brunt of that food crisis, it's farm workers, the ones who are actually doing the work to feed us. Wow, that's, I mean, but I'm really glad. I mean, the way you broke that down, Monica, is is very clear. And if anyone that's watching it or understanding it would easily see. But you also, like, you, you did have this town hall, yes, right? Was it yesterday? And you've had this call. And what other issues are being overlooked in this debate? Because, again, I go back to this sort of, like, this this notion that, Oh, they're essential workers and everything's fine and we're going to get our food. Uh, but, you know, there's lack of protections. It's what you're saying. The They can't get food. You know, the kids are home. Uh, language issues. Like, can you break other things that have, have um, that people are really overlooking? I think I, I don't think they're even being covered. Yeah, I mean, so, you know, one of the ones that I heard the family saying loud and clear was that, um they're really concerned about their kids' education, you know, because schools are out. And when you live in a rural community like I do, you know, I live in a very small community. And, you know, a lot of our, our kids are not doing the distance learning um, the way that other kids are doing it. So, you know, even in the school where my child attends, we received packets of papers that we had to complete with our child and, right. and return. Now there's distance learning happening where I live. But for these parents, you know, they don't have broadband. You know, they don't have access to broadband. They don't have the computers necessarily to do distance learning with their children. And um, if they're non-English speaking or if they're not literate, how are they going to help their kids fill out these packets of papers that have to be returned to the school in order for them to get credit, you know, in order for them to get graded and graduate? So there is a huge education equity issue um, that is negatively impacting I think kids in rural America overall, but right. specifically these children. Um, and parents are worried about that. Parents want their kids to have a good education. You know, the other thing that we've heard from parents around the country is that their kids have anxiety. They can't sleep. They're afraid. Children are asking if if they're going to die. Are their parents going to die? You know, we have parents who are talking about the fact that, you know, they – um, because they don't have child care, their choices are to, you know, leave their job, so quit their job, leave their children at home by themselves, which they obviously can't do, mm -hmm. or take their children to work with them, which is also not a safe choice for them. So they don't have any good options in this circumstance. And right. even though they're essential workers, they're not being given any of the essential benefits that other people are being given, right? So the overwhelming majority of farm workers in our country are undocumented. You know, so what that means is when we talk about the, you know, the stimulus check that people are going to be receiving in the mail, most of them are not going to be receiving it in the mail because they don't qualify for it. Um, you know, when we talk about the costs of even being tested for COVID or right. the cost of the kind of treatment and medical attention that people need, Farm workers, particularly if they're undocumented or, you know, immigrants of different statuses because there are all these, you know, exclusions and, and the bills that have passed, you know, they're they're most likely not going to qualify for that free um, testing or, or health care. And so so I keep saying to myself over and over again. So we have this category of workers that have never been protected in this country right. who do some of the most critical work. In fact, life sustaining work. Yeah, right now, for sure. 
like you've given them more. no safety net, no safety net. Right. And 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 now we're talking about who deserves to get what. Well, how can we say who deserves to get what when you're sending people out on the front line? You're sending in the mountain, the front line with no protection. And so then what's going to happen? Because when they get to work, they're not getting the protection they need. They're not getting masks. They're not getting gloves. They're not getting information. And even though they're entitled to have soap and water to wash their hands at work, many of them are reporting that they're not getting that either. So we are sending people out knowing what the consequences are, knowing what we need to do in order to keep ourselves safe. And we're not doing anything to keep themselves safe, to keep them safe. And I think that that is it is a shame. It is wrong. It is unconscionable. And the fact that people aren't outraged about it and we get to sit home comfortably and stockpile food that, that these families can't even access, I feel like we need a wake-up call in this country because people need to understand who is bearing the cost of this crisis. Yeah. Wow, Monica. Um, so th- I think the all the things that you raise, I feel like also this issue has interest, right? And I feel like, you know what I mean? It's like, if, if, if we are looking at a country and if what you're saying, right, it's like, we now have these essential workers are life sustaining. And there's an argument to be made. Uh, I'm not diminishing the work of our frontline responders, but at the same time, you know, people are feeding a country, like you're saying, it's like, we're going to stay home. It's like, we are not a country that knows how to make our own food right now. You know, this we're an industrialized like country that gets food, you know, we buy it, we purchase it. Our entire system is is based on production of food that is sent to consumers, right? I guess my question then in all this, is there anything happening on the political level that would suggest that protection for farm workers or would even have any hope in in this current pandemic. I mean, because you would think that there might be, but I'm not as close to it as you are. What have you learned? What are, what are people saying about the issue? I mean, you know, we're really fortunate because um, the Congressional Hispanic Caucus has been very open to her, hearing our concerns. Um, you know, Justice for Migrant Women and other organizations sent a pretty lengthy letter to Congress, first stating our concerns, and then we followed up with a letter with our policy priorities so they could consider them when they were coming up with these stimulus bills. And we're fortunate to have champions in the Congressional Hispanic Caucus who've been pushing and asking questions. um, And have they, you know, they sent a letter to the various agencies asking what was going to be done to keep farm workers safe. Because one thing that we have to remember is that there are these stimulus bills that say in this moment of crisis, there are things that need to be done to keep all of us safe, right? To right. help save the economy, to keep the essential workers safe. But then you have, even though farm workers don't have many rights, farm workers have some rights and they should actually have soap and water, you know, at work to wash their hands. There are things that should be happening that farmers for ever have just been ignoring and getting away with. And so making sure that we're enforcing the current law and that the Department of Labor and Agriculture and others are, are holding people accountable in this moment is also really important. And so we're we're lucky that, that we have members of Congress who understand that and are pushing for that. Um, you know, what's going to happen in this moment? I mean, we're going to continue pushing for this fourth stimulus bill to be an equitable bill. Um, I would say that many of the workers who are working right now who are essential workers are the kind the classes of workers who have not had enough rights, you know, as For, overall, forever. right? Forever. You know, so you're talking yeah. exactly. So we're seeing that. We're seeing that. Okay, if these workers had been better positioned before, maybe they wouldn't be as vulnerable right now. Maybe they wouldn't be in crisis now, and um, and. And so many of us are trying to push for those improvements and protections in this fourth stimulus bill. What will happen? I'm not sure. I'm not sure because I think that there are people that have really hard positions, Um, especially, you know, one of the things, one of the fears that the community has is that, um, you know, that there will be continued immigration enforcement. You know, one of the sticking points around extending benefits to everyone has been this question of immigration. And, you know, we've been talking about immigration together for nearly a decade. And I mean, just you and I and everyone, I mean, but yeah, like that's how we got to know each other. 
how we got to know each other. And 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 it's the same. It's the same fight, right? It's yeah. the same fight. Yeah. Fix broken system. There are humans who are suffering because yeah. you're not fixing the system who you, we rely on. Um, and I think that in this moment, we're seeing, you know, again, another example of how the system is broken and how entire classes of people are being left behind while we reap the benefits of their labor. And so I think that there are some members of Congress who are pretty very fixed in their position, and I'm not sure that they will move in this moment. Um, and I think that's why the voices of the public really matter right now, because right. we need to push them. We need to hold our political leaders accountable and tell them that we're not going to sit by and have people thrown out, you know, into work in these unsafe conditions and not give them any kinds of protections and benefits because it's not right. Yeah. And, and also, I think the point when I, you know, because I've been I talked to a, um, a guest worker who's not who who actually worked the last couple of years and is, is back in Mexico and, you know, there's this push to bring in more guest workers, right? You know, let's demand, you know, we're going to increase the food supply by bringing in more guest workers. But even in talking to some of the guest workers and, and the fear, there's a fear, the same issues are there, right? Like, this is not just, you know, one of the things that we're finding is that you have people who are like, I don't know if I'm going to come back, even though they've been doing this for years. I don't know if I'm going to come back because there are no protections, um, but there's also no opportunity in a place like Mexico. So what am I going to do? Um, and I think one of the things in me talking to this one worker uh, last week, um, a couple of days ago, Monica, is sort of the humanity of the voices. I think people don't have don't engage farm workers in general. Like we they they don't see them. They see through them. You know, they're they're the vegetable pickers or like, no, they're they're family. You know, they're people. They have hopes. They have dreams. Uh, they have kids. Um, they want to work hard. They understand yeah. that the benefit of working hard is going to benefit their family. They're exploited. They know the situation. They're very. They're actually much. We give them. We assume that unskilled labor means that people aren't intelligent. And I think that's one of the biggest misperceptions about this community is that they do have a voice. They they they're human, right? And I think. We tend to look over that as a country. I'm not saying you or I or other people, but you know what I'm saying? What final thoughts do you have about this? Because I think the, the dehumanizing of this is also part of it, no? Well, first of all, I think that a lot of people, when they go to the grocery store or the farmer's market, they don't think about, they, they don't think at all about the workers who got the food to their table. You know, I, you know, the food sort of is magically in the grocery store and then people buy it and they take it home. And, and and there are workers who have stories and who've sacrificed a lot and endure a lot to do the work and who are extremely proud of the work that they're doing. And, right. you know, I pick cucumbers um, here in my outside of my town uh, where I live in Ohio. And 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 it's extremely hard work. So for anyone who says it's unskilled labor, they've clearly never worked in the fields because it's exactly. hard. And it's really arduous. Um, but, you know, one of the things that inspires me, even though, as you say, you know, farm workers know that they are taken for granted and that they're being exploited and, you know, hearing from them about how now people finally see that they're important too, that they're essential too, you yeah. know, and such pride in that. And, you know, we've been doing, I don't know if you've been following my Instagram or other social, but we've been doing this campaign called Phenomenal Farm Workers for the reason that you're mentioning. We wanted to humanize farm workers. We wanted people to see farm workers. And so, you know, we, we have these photos of different workers with shirts that say phenomenal farm worker on them. And then we tell their story. And, yeah. and all the different interviews that we've been doing, people have said, we understand we have to keep going to work so that, that our community can have food. We understand that it's important and they want to keep doing the work, but they want to do it safely. And I think we owe that to them. We owe it to them to make sure that they're going to be safe as they do their work. They're not saying we don't want to go to work. They're right. not saying we should be allowed to stay home. They're saying, no, we get it. Our work is important, but just protect us. And yeah. so I think that what everyone tuning in can do to help this situation is talk about the people who bring food to our tables. Talk about the fact that they are underpaid and undervalued and at this moment they are in grave danger of getting this illness and if this virus 
spreads within the farm worker community, particularly in the labor camps that are so insecure in so many ways, there could be many, many people who get very ill and could potentially die. And we need to care about that, not just because it means our food supply might be insecure, but because they're human beings whose lives have value and who deserve to have people like us rooting for them and lifting them up and calling on Congress to give them this, the same rights, protections, and benefits. It's the least that we can do. Monica Ramirez, um, I just want to thank you. It's really good. I mean, I feel like we we just, you know, I feel like old times. We got the band back together. But uh, thank you so much for being on. We'll definitely follow up. Uh, but keep, you know, stay safe and keep fighting the fight that you always do. Monica Ramirez, thank you so much for being yeah. on. Thanks Bye. for having me. Bye. Take care. So that was Monica Ramirez. I just want to thank her for uh, really breaking it down. Guys, this was... Uh, the the eighth eighth show second week i couldn't get the intro working my mom has easter pie in the um in the uh in the freezer monica ramirez my mom also uh, thanked you for the show i thought she was fantastic too mom i think the notion of you know my mom's a nurse uh, the notion you know the first line responders versus the people that are the back line suppliers and they're both essential workers. So um, that's important. Thank you so much. Uh, let's close out. We'll be back Monday. I have a couple of, we'll have some surprise guests. Uh, I think I'm going to try to, I'm probably going to ask uh, Mariana Jose to come on next week. So that's cool. And I'm going to do a couple other surprises. But I'm going to see if I can finally do play the damn song. I couldn't get the song to play last night. So I'm going to try. But anyway, uh, we'll be back on Monday, 10 p.m. Eastern Standard. In the meantime, if you love Latino Rebels Radio, we'll have a couple of podcasts over the weekend. Um, also, in the thick, in the thick, um, we'll be on. Uh, we're going to have another in the thick. If you're an in the thick fan, the podcast that I do with Mariana Hosa, check out the Tuesday one. We're going to have our Friday one. Also, follow Futuro Media. Follow Latino Rebels. Thank you guys so much. Have a great week. Stay safe. I'm going to close out with Benas Abiertas. La plebe. It didn't work last night. It didn't work the night before. I'm really hoping it works tonight. And if not, um, hey, we tried. <laughs> anyway, I'll see you guys Monday. Stay safe. <laughs>